Yeah, that's a very good one, Jenny. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. So I'm bringing in Jim also, and people are already asking the questions. Um, there's, there's a question I'm going to flash on the screen right now. Uh, someone is asking the question that what can be done to children who seems not to understand what we teach through virtual learning? Um, I guess I would start by asking the question, what do you do when a student in a face-to-face -face class doesn't understand what you're teaching? Um, you would find another way to give that information to the student. Um, and Jenny just brought up some great ways of, ex of a, stu a student explaining what they know or don't know. They could draw, they could write, they could talk to you. And, um, and so I would suggest that, that you start with those kinds of things. Um, I think too that a lot of people think have this prejudice that online learning isn't as good as face-to-face. -face. And my feeling is that in many cases it's better, but in any case, it's just different. And different may be exactly what students want to learn. Um, I have two um, wives, <laughs> I have five grandchildren and uh, three of them live very close to me. So I, I get to and before COVID, at least, I got to see them quite a bit. And they had online pieces to their face-to-face -face class. And when I would go over, the one who is um, 11 years old would say to me, come see what the story I'm writing with my friend. And they were all doing it in Google Classroom. And they were collaborating in ways that they might not have a chance to do in a face-to-face -face classroom where instruction was going on or something else was going on. So I'll let Jenny take it. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's a super great advice, Jane. I think also one of the things that you can do in, in, in any class of, of 20 students or 30 students, I have five students who are, who are way ahead and they understand things really quickly. And, and that's just because the, the method of learning agrees with them. It works well for them. Um, it's, it's great to engage those students. And in fact, it helps them, them feel less bored. They sometimes feel bored and then they get in trouble. So those students that are, that are already ahead and have a kind of understand it, um, you can engage them to help explain it to their peers. So this peer-to-peer -peer learning, student-to-student -student learning is very valuable, you know, and you need to teach them how to do that respectfully so they don't make the student who doesn't understand feel stupid, <laughs> right? But, but that is one way of, of teaching your students to be um, civic minded, right? We're all, we're all in the boat together. All 30 of us in this class needs by the end of the year to learn all these things. How can you, if it's easy for you, how can you help your friend to learn better? So I love partnering with students to get them to help each other. Wow, that, that's a very good one. Uh, um, Karen had um, a reflection, um, kind of like looking for it. So uh, Karen said, uh, yes, thinking about thinking helps us understand what works for us. So what does thinking about thinking means in this uh, context? Uh, anyone, a response? Um, well, one, one thing would be, how is it that you learn? Do you learn best by stories? When people tell you a story, you get the message that that the story is about, not just what happened next? Um, is it that you learn best by drawing things, by writing things? So thinking about how you take in information and how you like to put out information would be helpful. And, and there's nothing wrong with taking some class time to have students reflect on that. Mm. Right. And I'd also as a teacher, reflecting on why you're teaching the way you teach. It's probably because you were taught that way. <laughs> it's probably because that way of learning works best for you. You know, so the, here's here's why my teaching practice, you know, thinking about that as part of metacognition is good. Encouraging your students again. And Jane's right. This self-directedness, this pull your pull your boots up. Make sure you understand as a as a learner, as a student, how you learn best and what you need so that you can advocate for yourself. Now, don't you think that's actually a challenge for teachers that were 
all trained and developed face to face now finding themselves in the online space and trying to look at how it works all, all over again in a different space. Yeah, we're not saying it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But what it is, you're walking in your students' shoes, John. Your yeah. students are confused. They don't understand. They've been used to face-to-face. -to -face. They're, they're frightened and upset, and they don't, you know, all the things that teachers are experiencing, their students are experiencing. So that great empathy piece that Jane is talking about, and make sure that you've got that going. That, that, and I love the word empathy because now everybody is shifting. So nobody is um, a knowledge, an island of knowledge in the other space. So we just have to uh, have, uh, the emotion, uh, have emotional intelligence for everyone to be able to kind of like look at how do we get this together and how does, uh, do we learn? Everybody's learning in a way, uh, getting to the online space. And quite honestly, our students are more resilient than we are. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> yes, especially the younger ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone asked a question. What resources do you have finding uh, resources for hands-on activities for young children who need to be engaged physically while learning online? Um, I can tell you one thing that um, the teachers at my grandson's school did, uh, which they really loved, is they had um, they had hunts. So the teacher gave them, for example, for younger kids, if they were looking at um, learning shapes, they gave, had a hunt and they had to go find something in their house that was that shape and then show it to the teacher and the other people in their class. So you can have kids go do things that would that would um, allow them to be active, but still contribute to learning for the whole group. Right, and I call these go outside activities. Um, and so <laughs> just go out, it's too much time on the computer, go outside. Uh, if you happen to have a mobile device or a camera of some kind, go outside and take pictures and, and, and really close up pictures and, and really think through connections between what you're trying to teach and what you believe your students might have access to in their environments and in their homes. It's a really great suggestion. I can also recommend OER Commons, has a lot of really great lesson plans and, and good ideas for activities for, for primary school and secondary school learners. It's a really great place to find some open resources for those types of suggestions. And I'll, I'll put in a plug for Merlot, which I'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Jane. <laughs> not one, not one. Um, but Merlot also has a wonderful collection of, of uh, lesson plans and resources for teachers to use. And I was thinking about another thing that, um, that I heard a, a, a teacher friend of mine say that she was teaching really young kids and was teaching them alphabet. And then she had them go and find things that started with that letter. Not something that you might not do in a face, you could probably do that in a face-to-face -face class, but in an online class, it gives them the opportunity to go, to move, to get, <laughs> and so on. Uh, that, there's an interesting question here. Uh, this person was asking, how can I manage a virtual class where some students quickly get the lesson and some takes a while? Uh, so what do we respond to that? That happens in every class, face to face. You've got the kid in the back who's thinking it through while the kid in the front's waving their hand and saying, I got it, I got it, I got it. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that that's not different from what we're used to. Um, one of the advantages of online is allowing that asynchronous part where the students do have time to reflect and think and ask questions and don't have to do it all of a sudden. So I would say an important piece is to include some asynchronous aspect to your class. Right. And there are lots of fun tools that you can, you know, if you have, again, this is access to internet and devices. It's, it's 
fairly privileged thing, but there are polling tools. You can figure out in an online live moment whether or not the students are getting it. You can ask them a quick question, see how they're doing. Um, it's in really important if you have the capacity to record and share those live sessions. So keep them short. No student wants a six hour live online teaching session. No student wants that. Keep them very short record them so for those students who are hard, having trouble grasping it can rewind and say what did she say or what did she show um, and then if you can include a transcript so the student can read through it and and find their find the part that they're having trouble understanding those kinds of tactics or strategies will help those students who are who are having a little more trouble getting it in the moment yeah. wow that's an interesting one then I, um, I wanted to ask a question that um, when Jenny was talking, you were talking about active, le <clears throat> active learning. And uh, I, um, I wanted to call, uh, ask that, would you relate it to the, the forces, creativity, uh, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, and what is really needed in the 21st century uh, market and all that right now? Mm -hmm. I think I think we need much much more creativity than than we have had in the past. We we are not going to get to move out of the the deep and dangerous economic recessions uh, and pandemic problems that we have right now without creative thinking. If we focus too narrowly um, in in status quo, the things we've always been doing, we're not going to come out safe. Um, so the more creativity we can encourage in in, in younger learners. Uh, in Canada, our, our population is aging significantly. We don't have as many young people as you have in nations in Africa. So we don't have as much, we can't tap into that creativity, that joy, that playfulness uh, of our young people as much. But finding ways to to respect that and to ask those learners to to stay creative, even from when a young age through secondary school into post secondary, um, and and demonstrate for them the ways that that creativity helps solve world problems. And so I love talking about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are a super fantastic way. Uh, of engaging students in solving wicked problems that actually are so hard to solve. Put them to work, they love it. They really love a good challenge. When we look at games, gamification, video games that students love, they love solving problems, really hard problems. So finding ways to, to pull them into that creativity is going to help them so much to, to establish better futures for themselves and their families and their communities. So creativity I think is critical. So Jane, how do uh, we uh, really think about creativity in terms of making it virtual or, or online learning? As it were? Making, I'm sorry, making what? As in, uh, create, uh, Jane just talked about creativity and critical thinking, it's very important. And how does it be uh, an embodiment or integrated fully into an online class, which is really what we're talking about right now? Well, I think one of the ways is to give students choices. And Jenny um, mentioned this earlier, but everything doesn't have, every assessment doesn't have to be a test. You could, you could give ch students a choice. You can take a test. You can write a paper. You can um, create a, a play or you can um, draw a picture. I remember once in one of my graduate in my doctoral classes, um, we had to read uh, Plato's uh, cave story and we, we had to do a response to it. And our teacher said, you can do any kind of response you want. Well, I'm a quilter. And so I actually made a, 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 a sheer quilt with layers and each of the layers had some aspect of Plato's cave in it. And she went nuts over it. She thought it was fabulous. And for me, it was just an absolute delight to be able to do something like that instead of to write yet another boring paper. <laughs> Uh, and this should be our last final question. How can examination malpractice be managed in a virtual class? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's question right now. Well, there, there, oh. are, there are multiple companies that are making millions of dollars selling online proctoring tools. Yeah. Uh, let me just say that. On the other hand, um, 
there's also the element of trust. And um, we can either trust that our students are doing what they're supposed to do, or we can, we can always be thinking that somebody's trying to cheat. And perhaps yeah. someone is, but I would say that the vast majority of our students are there to learn and are willing to do what they need to do to show that they have learned. Um, perhaps I'm naive, but that's <laughs> on it. Uh, no, I have to agree with you, Jane. Trust is really important. And again, it would be very difficult if the assignment was do, you know, talk about this play in any way you want. If you turn in a quilt, that's pre pretty much not using somebody else's work. You're not plagiarizing if that's the choice that you make. So, so giving those, giving the choices and, and again, realistically from a workload point of view, and we talk about this a lot, it's very easy to grade a multiple choice exam. The computer can do it for you. It's, it's easy. But a multiple choice exam is almost never a good representation of what a student really knows. It's not a good representation of a learning outcome. If you say to the students, I need you to be able to, to demonstrate or identify or discuss or describe, multiple choice test doesn't do that. I want them to tell a story and I want them to draw a picture and I want them to to focus on a part of that topic that has real meaning for them personally. And they will do am amazing work if you trust them in that way. Um, so thinking as teachers, thinking differently about how we were taught. I was taught with multiple choice tests. <laughs> I think the, the other thing too, is that if you have been interacting with students all along, you know how they write, you know how they talk, you know how they think. And if an exam shows something totally different, then maybe it's time to question the student about whether they in fact uh, did that. Yes, talking with them is a really good way to know what they know. And I understand also, uh, in many cases, um, for vocations, uh, there are professional exams in health sciences and trades and technology where health and human safety is involved. There are a lot of very formal exams that are important for that student's safety, for the safety of others. Um, but give them every opportunity to practice those exams in a way that they can take risks and make mistakes without feeling that they have failed.